As the, the young leaders prepare their messages to share it, to impart life and hope into the hearts of our young people, we felt that, and we feel that again, that the messages that are shared with the young people are not just for the young people. Everything that we share for them is as much value to you as it is to them. So this morning, we're going to have a few of the people who shared and put together information to impart to our young people this morning to share here with you. I'm going to start us off really quickly. Every year before we go on the camp retreat, we pray to God and we say, God, what is the theme that you have to impart to our young people? And every year it's different. Sometimes it's, it's been spiritual warfare. It's been um, the keys to the kingdom. It's been looking at what it means to be an overcomer how to cultivate community. And this year, we were praying and felt that all the things that were on, on our hearts seemed to be linked together with one word, and it was relationships. 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 So as we began praying, I started thinking about this book. Now, Howard's got a, a new book that he's released that he has... Uh, that God's really put on his heart and stirred him to put together. He's been so diligent to put together that book on eternal salvation, which is amazing. And by the way, Howard has no desire to peddle his materials. The church has no desire to make a profit off materials. His desire, his heart is to see people set free and to walk in liberty in their relationship with Christ and one another. And that is what that teaching does. But some of you who may not know, who may be are new to this church, he also did another book a number of years ago called The Seven Essential Relationships based on the teachings of his spiritual father, Brother Robert Ewing. And in this book, Howard talks about the, the ancient Israeli potter and how he takes the clay through several stages as he prepares it for use. And each of these stages line up in the life of Joseph and they also line up in each of us as believers. And each of us go through different seasons in our spiritual walk, growth, and development. And at each of these seasons, there's a test that we go through that we need to pass if we're going to continue to grow in Christ. One of the first basic relationships that we have to establish in our hearts, this is exactly what we share with young people, is building a relationship on the Word and a relationship with the Word of God. And that is the anchor that we want to continue to establish in the hearts of our young people. Dan prophesied about young people exploding and God doing a new thing in their hearts and seeing new things happen. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If that work is going to happen, if it's going to be explosive, it's going to be contained... If we're going to contain that explosion and have it put to any good use, then the hearts of those people who carry that fire must be grounded and anchored in the Word of God. Amen? That is the premise of Howard's message in the book, and that is what we imparted to our young people. A lot of people know about the Bible. A lot of our young people have come through the VBS programs and the Sunday school programs and the youth programs, and they know about the Bible. They can tell you lots about the Bible. But the question is not, do you know the Bible? The question is not, do you understand the Bible? The question is, do you have a relationship with God's Word through fellowship with His people, through prayer? Do you have a personal relationship with the Word of God? And this is what we want to encourage our young people to cultivate. Do you know His Word as a companion that walks with you so that when the trials of life come upon you, do you and are you able to stand? Amen? It is the it is the foundation that we need to be built on if we're going to walk in that power and that explosion that we hear of. Howard has said before, if we're only in the Word and the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, theology, 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 and doctrine, you will dry up. And if we're always wanting to move in the great things of God, the power and the gifts of God, we will blow up. But when we have a balance of the two in our lives... 
If there's a balance of the rich expressions of the spirit and the supernatural power of God in our lives, and we are founded and grounded on the word of God, we will grow up. This is the principle that we have imparted to our young people to see the culture of the kingdom growing here in this church and what we want to see growing in each of the churches in this city. And it's our responsibility as ambassadors of the kingdom of God and as ambassadors of Christ to proclaim that message, that the word of God does not change. And it is the anchor that our lives and our churches and our families must be built on if we're going to see victory in our lives. Amen? CJ. Wow. That's quite the introduction. I'll do my best to uh, maintain that energy. I don't know if I have quite that level this morning, but God's good. Amen? Uh, Cool. I'm just going to pray, and then I'm going to jump right in because I want to make sure I don't take up too much time. Awesome. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much uh, for just this opportunity to speak this morning. God, I just pray over myself, God, just a surrenderance of my of my tongue and my mind, God, that it would just speak your words. Um, and I pray for the congregation that they would just have open ears and open hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Cool. Well, I always prepare notes, but I like to move around. I like to look around, so I probably might get a little off here, but I'll try and keep it as close as possible. And I also say that because I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of the Bible, but if I get off, please call me out. Um, So what I'm going to talk about today is a relationship basically with the world and with things of the world. Is that okay? Cool. Uh, So the story comes out of Matthew 19, starting at verse 16, if you want to turn there. Um, Now, it's a story about a young man. The Bible doesn't give him a name, so I'm going to call him Kyle, if that's okay. (laughs) So Kyle is hanging out. He sees Jesus. And his boys, and he goes up to him, and he's like, teacher, what good deed, what good stuff do I have to do to get eternal life? And Jesus looks at him, and he's like, why are you asking me what's good? I think Jesus was being a little cheeky with him, you know, because Jesus knows he's a Messiah, but Kyle obviously doesn't. He just thinks he's a teacher. He says, there's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. And Kyle's like, okay, which ones? There's like 10 of them. And Jesus responds, he's like, well, first off, it would be really good if you didn't kill anybody. Uh, You should probably not cheat on your wife if you have one. Uh, Don't steal anything. Don't tell any lies. Uh, Honor your mom and dad and love your neighbor as you would yourself. And Kyle's like, sweet. Got it. Doing all of those things. What else must I do? And Jesus turns and looks at him and he says, well, if you want to be perfect... You need to sell all of your possessions, give all of your money away, and then come and follow me. And Kyle is pretty bummed about that because he was pretty rich. He had a lot of stuff. He didn't want to get rid of it. So he turned and he didn't come back. I'm going to pause the story there for a minute because I think a lot of us are a lot more like Kyle than we care to admit. I think that a lot of us have stuff that we love in this world that if Jesus asked us to get rid of, we would have a really difficult time letting go of. Not necessarily money, could be anything. An example from my life, when I first came to this church, a lot of you know my testimony, uh, I was doing a lot of stand-up comedy uh, and a lot of improv comedy. And probably three weeks before I rededicated my life, the guys I did improv comedy with played a sold-out show at the McManus Studio in the Grand Theater, which is about 130 seats. It was a pretty big deal, right? But the stuff that we were doing was eh, not exactly uh, kosher, if that's the right use of that word. How- Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, sweet. Uh, not exactly spiritually kosher. And I felt the Lord saying, CJ, you got to stop doing this. You can't do it. But I love doing it. What just happened right there when everybody laughed? That makes me so happy. I love making people laugh. It's one of my favorite things to do. 
So I had to go to these guys that I had done comedy with for six years and be like, hey, guys, I'm sorry. I know we're picking up a little bit of steam here, but I'm out. I got to go. And it hurt. It was really difficult to do. And thankfully, the Lord has given me a little bit of a, an opportunity to, to relive that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was really difficult to do that. But what we do when we give up something like that is that we allow God to place something better in our lives. And when we do it, it speaks volumes to those around us. These guys I've known for, for six years, they're like, what do you mean? You're doing this because of Jesus? What? I said, yeah, I can't really explain it to you in any other way than that. I feel like I can't do this anymore. And maybe they weren't like oh my gosh, we got to figure out what's up with this Jesus thing. But it spoke into them, right? Because it had a, my salvation, my rededication had affected me enough that I was willing to get rid of something I loved so much. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go out and like, you know, Jesus asked Kyle, he's like, get rid of all your money, toss it out. I'm not saying that you have to do that or get rid of everything you own. But if there's something that he is asking you to get rid of, we have to be obedient in that. It could be anything. I'm not necessarily saying money. I'm not necessarily saying comedy. Whatever it is, we all have individual things that we enjoy doing, things that maybe are of the world that we really like. And they're not necessarily bad things. Sometimes it's alcohol. Sometimes it's drugs. For me, another thing is reading comic books. I love comic books. I was just at an expo in Toronto for two days. I spent an absurd amount of money. My wife is probably really upset about that. And I love it. And in fact, if you don't see me for a little while, she talk to her. I'm probably tied up somewhere or I'm, I'm, she put me back into the work. I got to work for seven days. I don't know, whatever. Um, hey, if I go missing, it was my wife. Anyway, I love those things. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But it becomes bad when it replaces my time and my relationship with Jesus, right? And it's, it's difficult to kind of to check yourself in that way. Because when, like when I come home from work, I get home, I want to kick my feet up. You know, I want to watch Netflix. I want to play a video game. I've, it's very rare that when the first thing I do is jump right into my Bible. And we all have those things. <clears throat> Sorry, see, this is why notes, you got to have them. Yeah, so when we were on the camping trip, when I was delivering this message, I started to ask the, the kids, what, start thinking about some things that are in your life that maybe you need to get rid of, that maybe God is asking you to get rid of that you're not necessarily willing to do or to get rid of. And if it is something serious, something not so serious like comic books, whatever. Meet with people because part of the relationship aspect of the camping trip is that we're all together, right? We're a family for those four days. I mean, we're still a family now, but we're really a tight-knit family for those four days. Confess things that you need to get rid of. Confess it to Jesus. Confess it to people that are close to you for accountability, you know? It's good. Because when he takes those things, the story continues in the Bible. Because after, after Kyle walks away, he's really bummed out. He's really sad. Peter, the disciples, they're all like, well, you know, how can anybody be saved? Right? Even if we give stuff up, like, you know, if there's, there's no way to do it, if there's no way to live the perfect life. Jesus says, assuredly, I say to you, and the Son of Man sits on his throne when he comes back. People who have given up things will be rewarded 100-fold. I want to be rewarded 100-fold. I don't want something silly like comic books or video games or alcohol or drugs or whatever to get me something less in the next life. I want all that stuff. I want the 100-fold. Amen? Sweet, that's all I have, because the, the next part of this like, was an activation piece, but we already had one like earlier, and there's like four more people to get through. But 
when uh, we do at the end of the service, when we have prayer, just kind of think about it while the next uh, group of people are talking. If you have something you need to confess, something you want Jesus to replace in your life, bring it up and give it to him. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks, CJ. Kyle? Kyle. Yeah, you don't, it could have been his name. Could have. Could have. I think there was a lot of Kyles back then, I'm sure. <laughs> For those of you I haven't met, my name is Anna Wozniak. I have uh, been privileged to be part of youth leadership here at Open Door for the last six and a half years. And uh, I want to talk to you today about breaking up with the world. Jason was sharing earlier about our relationship with the Word of God, and man, he might have even had enough time to get in a little bit about being a doer of the Word. And... Um, we just heard about, you know, Kyle and, um, and about how hard it can be, but how worthwhile it is to give up things for the Lord. And I want to talk to you a bit about that because this world that we live in is kind of programming our minds day and night. So there's a reason why it is hard to be a doer of the word. I mean, it's really easy to say that, well, read your word and be a doer of the word. But how many can admit that it's actually kind of easier said than done, right? So the thing is, is that this world is all programmed by the God of this world, and it goes right in sync with our natural default position, our flesh, and our wrong desires, right? But on the other hand, we've got the king of kings, the God who made us and knows us better than anybody else, who formed us in our mother's womb and can be trusted to actually figure out what will satisfy us. And there's this pull between the two, and the two don't really co-respond. Like, co they don't get along well, right? There's this natural pull that is going to be happening. So the world... Um, we, we're seeing their perspective through media and through the mindsets around us and the expectations around us. And it's dazzling sometimes, but they have it all backwards. It's full of lies and empty promises. This world tells us we, that we are only beautiful if we look a certain way and we see these images all the time and we hear comments about it all the time. People turn themselves inside out trying to achieve it and healthy is good. That's what God would agree with. Often it's mixed. It's truth, a little bit of truth mixed with a lot of poison, right? So this world tells us that we have to look a certain way, but they don't know that we are all made in God's image. And this world tells us that if we just prioritize our job above everything else in life, then we will be successful. But we serve a God who knows better than that. And the world tells us that our happiness is just one more purchase away. And what happens when you make that next purchase? Does the happiness last? No, because it's just one more purchase away, right? Right? And the cycle continues. This world tells us that if we work hard during our career, then we can get to do anything we want and be at peace and be completely happy in this little window at the end of life called retirement. That little window where your body is breaking down, that's what it's all about. Because this world doesn't have an eternal perspective. This world doesn't understand that our entire time here on earth is just a puff of smoke and it's just to get ready for the real deal. But they can't see that because they don't have an eternal perspective. Our God does. And so Jesus came to teach us a new way and one that is so very countercultural. He said, my way is different. Do you trust me? And he is always whispering that to us, no matter what the world is doing. We all make choices every day, but some of them become pivotal in our lives. And sometimes you can't see it in the moment until years later. How many have ever been there where you can look back and say, yeah, that choice I made, I didn't know it then, but that was pivotal to the outcome of my life. Yeah, you get it. Doing things God's way does not look like an increase of self-effort. It doesn't look like whipping yourself with stricter religion. Those things have never worked, and they never will. It is simply a yielding of our will 
to God's will. James tells us to let God work his way in us. If he made us, if he knit us together in our mother's womb, it would stand to reason that he knows how to transform us for the better and for the way that is most satisfying to us, right? But here's the catch. He's given us a free will. So that's where our part comes in. Saying yes to allowing God to do this in our life is going to look different for everybody. One moment that stands out in particular in my life was when I was younger, when I was in high school. It was between, the summer between grade 10 and 11. And I had just got home from this youth conference. It's called DC 91. And they had packed 13,000 of us into this stadium in Washington, DC. And they got us all excited about God. And they asked us, if you were the only one left standing for Jesus, would you do it? And I said, yes. And I meant it. My heart was on fire. But you see, what had been happening leading up to that trip was, well, grade 10, I was a late bloomer. And I started to get a lot of attention from the wrong people. But it felt great. It feels great when that guy is the most popular guy in the school and hotter than Lord knows what. And he's flattering you, right? But here I was at this conference saying, yeah, I would do that. I'd be the one to stand alone for Jesus. And within 24 hours of getting home, the phone rang. And it was the most popular guy in the school along with his best friend. And they had one question for me. They wanted to know point blank whether I believed in premarital sex. So basically they wanted to know if their efforts were gonna get anywhere with me. And I knew that depending on my answer, my dad's here, he's like, they what? <laughs> so I knew, I knew that depending on my answer, I was either going to go through a very hurtful, lonely season of life, um, or I was going to enjoy a lot more flattery. But I also knew that all of heaven was waiting on my answer. Now, that was one of the hardest answers I ever had to give up to that point in my young life. It was very difficult to answer them. And I did it right, <clears throat> barely. It was, I think, like I could barely get the words out. But I was right in that it did lead to a very lonely season. And I was labeled and bullied and called names, and I went through a very, very lonely semester during first semester of grade 11, and it hurt. And yet there was a peace on the inside. The part that I was wrong about was how much I underestimated the God I serve. You see, I didn't realize how good he is. And that there is nothing we can give up for him here on this earth that he will not more than make up for us. And I'm not just talking about on the other side. I'm talking about here. And I underestimated that part. You see, second semester of grade 11, he started turning that high school inside out for Jesus. And it was the most thrilling thing you could be a part of. It amazes me to this day what he pulled off and the way people still talk about it today. But personally, I underestimated how much he would make it up to me. If there are two areas in my life that I am rich now, one of them is friendship. Ever since then, ever since that short season of testing, didn't seem short at the time, <laughs> but just a few months, ever since then, I am so rich in that area. I could talk about it, but I'd make you all jealous. God has provided in such a beautiful way in my life in the area of friendship. And if there is another thing I am rich in, it is flattery from my husband. I just happened to marry a guy a few years later who is really good at compliments. And... <laughs> Over 24 years of marriage later and four kids later, there is hardly a day that goes by that he does not gush on me. Probably makes our kids want to vomit. But I'm telling you, he's really good at this. And I don't think those two, I, th I think there's a correlation there. 
I think God was more than putting into my life what I was willing to give up for his sake. Because that's how our God works. <clears throat> so I knew I was saying the right answer that day, but I had no idea what kind of blessings I was releasing over my life because of it. Man? So sometimes it feels like we can have both in those moments. It feels like we can kind of keep playing this game with the world and keep flirting with the world, but have God too, right? But how many of you have ever tried riding two horses with one butt? Sorry, I'm from the country. It doesn't work, does it? James warns us, you're cheating on God if all you want is your own way. Flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God and his way. It's not an overnight process. It's a change in course, and eventually we end up in a completely different place. I was literally doing that back then, and that's what it took to snap me out of it. The concept of trying to please both God and this world we live in at once is not a new problem today in Christianity. And I know that because the letters that we see written in the New Testament, that verse that James wrote, he was writing it to the believers of that time. That was for the church. He saw something that he was very concerned about, and he's not the only one. Peter and James and Jude and Paul, a whole bunch of them dealt really clearly with this, begging us not to be deceived by this world we are living in warning us of what happens when our hearts are divided. First Timothy says, there are some, you know, who by relaxing their grip and thinking anything goes have made a thorough mess of their faith. The truth is, truth bomb here, we're all a slave to something. We're either serving the whims of our flesh and the God of this world, or we're serving Jesus. Jesus taught us that if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Even those who are in this world and seem to have won at this world's game are empty still without him. Consider a dictator. Consider all the power that he has, all the luxuries at his disposal. Is he content? Does he sleep well at night? No. Why is that? Because of the God he's serving. Think about the rich and famous. Think about Hollywood. Consider their divorce rates and their drug rehab patterns and their suicide rates. The actor Jim Carrey said on July 3rd, 2015, he said, I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see it is not the answer. This world has lied to you, and it will continue to. But our God will not disappoint. Men? John 10.10, 10, we read that the thief has come to kill, steal, and destroy. But what? But I have come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. So if you're going to serve someone your entire life, choose with your eyes wide open who? And might I suggest that you sell out to someone who truly loves you. And someone who, uh, Andrew, are you next? Come on up, bro. But yeah, somebody who can more than replace anything you will ever give up for him. Beyond your wildest dreams, you have not begun to think or imagine what he has in store for you. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm passing the baton here. Hello, I'm Andrew. I'm just going to pray real quick. Father, thank you for this opportunity to um, share a little bit of your word and a little bit of what you've put on my heart, Lord God. And I pray that it would build up people in this room, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, my, my topic here today is building each other up in your community. So I'm just going to get right into it because I've got a lot to do and I'll do my best to stay on time. Um, as a group of people that are connected to each other, it is very important that we're here for each other as best we can, not just to help, but to encourage one another. 
The word encourage means to give support, confidence, hope, to build somebody up, to literally give them courage. Acts 9.31. So the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoying peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. It says being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church continued to increase. The church being built up by the Holy Spirit and by the the members involved in that church led to increase. Being faithful perhaps is one of the greatest way we can build each other up. There's a story of a homeless man and some men that were filming acts of kindness. Um, I don't really know if they were Christians or if this was a rigged story, but I thought the story was, was really cool when I watched it. It was a YouTube video. These men set out on whatever their agenda was to film acts of kindness. Um, so they approached a man sitting on a street by a big fence, um, and one man was on one side of the road filming a cross to watch the other man approach him, and he approached him and gave him some, some money. And the homeless man um, thanked him for the offer, and he said, well, will you wait here for a minute? I'll be right back. So he agreed, and then so the homeless man went off, and then um, the guy that was giving him the money looked across the street to the cameraman, and he, um, he kind of was confused, what, what should I do? So they decided they'd wait. So some time passed, and uh, the homeless man came back with two styrofoam containers filled with food, and he asked the man, will you sit and you eat with me? So he agreed, and he did. So he spent that money that he gave him to buy him food and himself food. And they sat there and ate with him. And a tear fell down the homeless man's eyes. And he says, it's been 10 years since I've been able to eat a meal with somebody. Um, The homeless man just wanted someone to talk to. He wanted someone to give him some of their time. And that made his day. Building each other up is not trying to change someone or to make their way, their will line up with anything other than God's will. He sat and ate with the man and just listened to him, giving him, some, him something he probably hasn't had in years, a smile on his face. There is no better way to be faithful to someone than to give them your time. I remember one day I came home from work and, um, you know, a, a busy guy and um, I was just had a thousand things on the go. I came home from work, was ready to go and do something. And I saw my mom sitting on the couch um, and she was pale and she was um, obviously ill of some kind and asked her what's been going on. She said that she had had a fever. She felt nauseous, weak. Her body was sore. Um, and she went to the doctors and they took some blood tests and they couldn't figure out any reason why she should be like this. It wasn't an obvious illness or anything like that. So I went upstairs and I went to the shower um, and... Um, In the shower, I was feeling really bad for her, and I thought to myself, and I think it was God speaking to me, when's the last time you told your mother you loved her? And so that really hit my heart hard, because I couldn't remember the last time I told my mom, I love you. So I went downstairs after the shower, and I, um, she was preparing dinner for my dad at that time, and I pulled her aside, and I said, put down the knife, and, um, Yeah, and then um, so I gave her a hug and I told her that I loved her and she had a smile on her face and she said, thank you very much. Um, The next, I went off to go do what I was doing that day and then the next day I came home from work and I saw her and she was in the kitchen again and she had color back in her face. She was smiling, she was standing tall, right? Um, So I don't, I I didn't talk with her about it necessarily. I didn't, it wasn't like, oh, you've been healed in Jesus' name sort of moment, but I spoke words of life into somebody and I saw healing brought to them, right? So that's a very important thing. Romans 12, 18, do all that you can to live at peace with each other so much as it depends on me. It depended on me to listen to the Holy Spirit and act. Verse 9, don't just pretend to love each other, really love them. Hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. It is very easy to live in the same house and not do bad and act like that that's love. It's really easy to do that. It's really easy for me to come home and not be a bad child and act like that's showing my mom love. Love costs. Love is active and it takes initiative to show love. Romans 14, 19. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Matthew 6, 21. Wherever your treasure is, there too the desires of your heart will also be. 
Um, so you guys all know about Paul, um, or Saul, I should say, and all the things that he did. And he went to the synagogues and asking for um, their cooperation to arrest followers of the way. Um, and that's Acts 9.1. So when, all, when, when somebody comes to us and, and we're, we're being persecuted, things are tough, things are hard, or whether it's some other form of persecution, if we're not here building each other up, building life into each other, how can we be successful when those trials come? So if we continue on, though, in Acts 9.1, um, as he approached Damascus on the mission, he was a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him, and he fell to the ground, and a voice sang, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So he did that, and his, fault, his followers helped him. And um, he was told to... Um, Go to, sorry, he, he, his followers helped him. And so then the Lord spoke to a man named Ananias shortly later on in that ver, uh, chapter. Um, there was a believer, in Ananias, uh, sorry, a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke with him in a vision saying, Ananias, yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to the straight street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming and laying hands on him so he can see again. But the Lord exclaimed Ananias, I have heard many things that people talk about the terrible things he's done um, and um, of the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest anyone who calls upon your name. But Lord said, go to Saul for he, he Saul is my chosen instruments to take my message to the Gentiles and the kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias had a choice here. He, he, he was obviously scared of, of Saul, and um, he, he knows all the things he's done, but yet he chose to obey God, even though it, it might, might be hard, it might be difficult. So Ananias went and found Saul, and he laid his hands on him and said, and said Brother Saul. Isn't that interesting? Brother Saul, his cold demeanor changed based on the choice he made to obey God. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. So what happened there? He didn't lay hands on him and, and say, in Jesus' name, may, may you see again. He simply spoke kind words and obeyed God's commands. And what happened? Saul was able to see again. He spoke words of life. He built him up. He made a choice to listen to God and do what he was commanded to. So then, um, after he regained his sight, he got up and was baptized. Who might have baptized him? Ananias or the other believers around? Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Who probably fed him? Ananias. You can see here that Ananias had a choice. He could listen to and obey God and the command and take the man he feared and do what God had told him. Or a third of the Bible perhaps may not have been written if he didn't choose to do that simple little thing of speaking life and building up a brother in the way that he could. One person led a guy like Billy Graham to the Lord and one person obeyed God and talked with Saul. We have a great opportunity in our lives to listen to God or not. Matthew 6, 21, wherever your treasure is there too, the desires of your heart will also be. Let's take the opportunities while we have them and while they matter, because sometimes we lose our opportunity to give time, because time always runs out and it is not eternal. Sometimes we are called to take, be taken out of our comfort zone and grow. Like when I go to the gym, um, I don't go and lift comfortably if I want to get stronger. I do something that's challenging to me. And in the same way, I think spiritual things grow as well. We have to be taken out of our comfortable area and then be challenged by what God is doing. So for example, when I volunteered to preach on this trip, I'm very bad at public speaking, but I knew that there's potentially an opportunity to grow in God for him to use me. And so it took a lot of time to, to, to get over some of those things and realize that maybe there's something bigger that God wants to do with something that I can do. He will use you wherever you're at. Just ask him and be willing to take him up on it when he speaks. He speaks with me most often through my heart. 
People say things to me. I see things. I read things in the Bible. And then my heart directs me. So that's pretty much it. All right, home stretch. Why don't we all just lift our hands and stretch a little bit? If you're with me, wave those hands a little bit. Okay. So, all right, let's get into it. Nine minutes. I'm going to do a 50-minute message in nine minutes. You guys ready? It's almost like a magic show about to happen up here. Just kidding. We don't believe in any of that stuff. Um, all right. Uh, today... I'm going to be speaking about something I spoke on the camping trip, which is about cultivating a relationship with God's glory. Now, right off the bat, I want to make a statement. And if you're someone who writes notes, I want you to write this down because this is important, okay? You, 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 every single person in this room, you were created to be in a relationship with the glory of God. Some of you are nodding and they're like, ah, I don't know, Nick, like this is something that's essential. You need to know that you were created to be in a relationship with God's glory. And you know how I know? The Bible teaches us to pray that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. But what is that will? Actually, in an obscure book in the Old Testament, in the book of Habakkuk, uh, chapter 2, verse 14, it says this, that in a prophetic time, the time that I believe we're living in, it says the knowledge of the glory of God will fill the whole earth even as the waters cover the seas. See, that's what it means for his kingdom to come and for his will to be done, that the knowledge of the glory of God would cover the whole earth even as the water covers the seas. Now, what does that mean, the knowledge of the glory of God? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says this, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has caused his light to shine in our hearts, revealing the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. That's what the knowledge of the glory of God is, that every single person on the earth will know the person of Jesus. See, Isaiah had an encounter with the glory of God. When he went into the temple and he saw God's glory, what did he say? He said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth, there it is again, the whole earth is filled with his glory. So you guys believe me now? You were created to be in a relationship with the glory of God. So why don't you turn to the person beside you, maybe they weren't listening this morning, and tell them, you were created for the glory of God. That's good news, right? Why don't we take a moment, and if you believe it for yourself, just put your hand over your heart and say, I, I believe I was created for the glory of God. That's important. Some, day, some days you got to get up, look at yourself in the mirror, and you need to say that to yourself. I was created for God's glory. It says we're to go from glory to glory as we behold his presence with an unveiled face. Actually, it's interesting. In Romans 8, it says that, He's poured out his spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father, right? Amen. We're children of God. But you know what it says right afterwards? It says, well, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, that we may also share in his glory. It's right there, right? We are made to be in a relationship with the glory of God. Point number one. Now, Point number two, let me take all the pressure off of us for a second. Because me growing up, I thought living for someone's glory meant doing amazing things in their name and, and trying to somehow, you know, live this amazing life, right? Let me take all the pressure off of you. There's this, there's this quote from a man named John Piper that I love. And he says this, he says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Amen? Let that sink in there. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. The Bible would put it this way. If we abide in him and he in us, we will bear much fruit. And apart from him, we can do 
nothing. So this is what I'm trying to say. When it comes to cultivating a relationship with the glory of God, it's not about doing glorious things. It's about allowing the glorious one who lives in you to begin to live through you. Does that make sense? That's what, that's what Paul says to the Colossians, right? He says, there's this mystery. There's this mystery that people of God have been searching for for a long time. And he says, I'll give you the, the mystery free of charge. He says, the mystery is this. Christ in you, the hope of glory. glory. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So it's not about doing mighty exploits. It's about this enjoying God to the point where his mind becomes your mind, where his words become your words, where his heart becomes your heart until you are the very hands and feet of Jesus on this earth. Amen? God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I haven't even gotten to the part where I was going to share. Amen. Howard, how are you doing? Are you going to share afterwards? Um, okay, I will tighten this up a little bit. Uh, I was talking specifically about one aspect of God's glory. How many people know God's glory is multifaceted? It's multidimensional. It's more than just one thing. I mean, in worship, we experience the glory of his presence, right? When, when we're there and we're worshiping and we just sense that the king of glory has come into the place, right? That's the glory of his presence. I want to talk specifically this morning about the glory of his name. And the specific way we relate to God's glory in our lives is by faith, right? It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because those who come to him must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him. So we relate to God's glory by faith and specifically the type of faith I'm talking about is creative faith. So creative faith is this, faith in the miraculous, miracle-working, creative power of God. That whole let light shine out of darkness, that's the creative power of God. Romans chapter 4 puts it this way when it describes Abraham, the father of faith, right? It says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And later on it says, Abraham believed God, the God who raises the dead and calls the things that are not as if they are right? That's your definition of creative faith right there. Calling that which is not as if it is, right? And what creative faith does is creative faith releases the glory of God's name. So there's there's a story in the Bible, probably one of my absolute favorite stories in the Bible. It's in the book of Acts. It's right after Peter has stood up and preached and 3,000 people have been saved. The church is moving and him and his buddy are walking to the church. They're walking to the temple and they see a man there who's begging. It's at the temple gate, beautiful. It says he was there for 40 years. Like this guy was a staple in the community as someone who does that. And they look at him and they say, what do you want? And he says, well, what do you think? Like, this is what I do for a living, right? Do you have any money? And how many of us have walked by people like that, right? There's still people that we see that are like this man. God loves them. You know what Peter says? Peter activates creative faith in his life. Who here knows what he says? He looks at the man and he says, oh, brother, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I will give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And it says the man's bones were strengthened and he stood and he walked and he leapt and he praised God into the temple. Which by the way, he had no right going to as a cripple, but now that he was healed, he had full access to go to the temple. Isn't that amazing? But it says he walked and leapt and praised God. It was for the glory of God's name. He wasn't saying, man, Peter is this amazing man of God. Do you know who was saying that? The religious people. They came up to Peter afterwards and said, how did you do this? What's going on? And he was baffled. He's like, you guys are acting as if somehow my own power or godliness healed this guy. He's like, let's just get this clear. It is by faith in the name of Jesus that this man stands here healed before you. See, creative faith releases the glory of God's name. Amen. All right, Howard. (laughs) 
Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? You know, I just, um, I'm not here to preach or anything. I just wanted to hear the young people. But, you know, one thing that I heard when each spoke is a high regard for the authority of the Word of God. And in this time that we live in, the Word of God is looked down upon by Christians. When Christians argue, is this right? Is that right? Why can't we do this? Maybe we could do that. The reason those questions come up is because they have a low regard for Scripture. But this morning we have seen these young people stand up and honor the Word of God. And they have said, we will submit to the authority of God's word in our lives. We will change anything that is contrary to the word of God so our lives conform to the word of God to glorify Jesus. And that's so wonderful. That's so wonderful. Because the attack that is happening amongst Christians around the world is compromise. It's not that the Word of God is not clear. It's that they don't want it to be clear. And so I just rejoice. I want to thank each one of those people that have shared this morning. Thank you so much.